Fuel Cult Show podcast, where we talk about all things fuel for all kinds of people. I am your host, Eric Bjornstad, and I'm your guide through the ever-changing world of fuel. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, today we are going to continue our discussion about the properties of your stored fuel, why those properties matter, and what the problem could be if those properties fall out of line. And of course, what, if anything, you can do about that if you're in that kind of situation. Now, in the past, we talked about the property of water and sediment content in diesel fuel, which is one of the most important parts of the ASTM D975 fuel specification. So today, we're going to talk about another property, that of fuel acidity. Now, we want to talk about why that's important to pay attention to, but also We want to talk about how there are some misconceptions about fuel acidity when it comes to the health of your diesel fuel, that if we don't know to take those into account, they can possibly lead us down the wrong path when it comes to knowing uh, if we might have a problem with our stored fuel that we need to do something about. So fuel acidity, there are different definitions of acidity depending on the context. And for our purposes, we are mostly interested in this, the idea of acidity um, to the extent that it is linked to causing or contributing to problems that we're going to then need to solve or take steps to prevent. Now, these days, in whatever context, whenever you talk about acidity, most commonly you're going to mention the pH scale. Normally, the the pH of healthy stored diesel fuel is going to be somewhere between 8 and 5.5. Now, later we'll talk about how pH may not always be the best way to measure acidity in fuel. But for now, we'll use pH numbers as reference points to help us understand the broader concepts uh, because pH is the acidity metric that people are most familiar with. So. Fuel is normally between 5.5 and 8, and yet the acidity of stored fuel can increase over time due to a number of different factors. Uh, One big one are microbes. Microbes are a big causal factor in this, especially if you've also got water present in the tank. Microbes will produce acidic byproducts in the course of uh, reproduction and living their life cycles, those acidic byproducts can make the fuel more acidic. There's also certain kinds of chemical reactions that can happen in fuel, like oxidation reactions, hydrolysis reactions, and those can change the acidity of the fuel and lower its pH number. Even just simple aging of the diesel fuel can turn it acidic over time. And we need to be concerned about those things because acidic fuel conditions can be associated with problems developing that will then require us to take action. So what kind of problems? Well, let's talk about some of those. So a big thing uh, is that acidic fuel conditions are correlated with corrosion damage in storage tanks. And you might expect that to be true. It's especially true if the acidic conditions are associated with microbial contamination. Now, we tend to see this kind of corrosion in a number of different places in a typical storage tank. Uh, Places like near where the fuel water interface is, uh, corrosion in piping on valves in dead legs, weld joints and seams. It's common to see corrosion on the tank bottoms if you've got a layer of water down there as well. And you can get corrosion on internal tank surfaces wherever biomass has been formed by microbes. In fact, let's not unduly overlook Uh, that biomass that we might find in the tank. Uh, Corrosion is strongly associated with the presence of microbial biofilms. Microbes will form, they'll produce biofilms uh, and lay them down on the internal surfaces of the tank. And these biofilms can harbor, they can do a number of different things. They can harbor uh, or make a home for corrosive bacteria uh, that will li- the, will live inside of them in kind of their own little uh, uh, ecosystem, if you will. Uh, and the biofilms will also create areas where these localized environments can form 
within the biomass layer up against the metal and up against the tank surfaces that are conducive, they have conditions that are conducive to creating corrosion damage through a number of different mechanisms. Now, how that happened, you know, what those uh, different mechanisms are, uh, can that kind of discussion can get down into the weeds a little bit. So maybe in a later episode, we, we may want to talk about the details of how these microbial biomass formations do a lot of damage in fuel storage tanks. But for now, to keep things at a little bit of a higher level, we'll just say that where there's biomass, there's microbial contamination, and that there's a really close relationship between this microbial contamination and the presence of acidic fuel conditions, which means if the fuel in a storage tank shows itself to be acidic, it strongly hints at the likelihood of some pretty serious microbial contamination also being present. You could say that acidity is a direct cause of tank corrosion while also being a secondary indicator that microbial contamination is present, which itself can be directly related to other problems being in your fuel. All this to say, it should be a part of good fuel husbandry to keep track of your fuel's acidity. But in order to do that, you need to have a good way to assess what that acidity level is, a good way to test or a good way to measure it. Now, remember earlier when we said there were some misconceptions about ways to assess acidity in your fuel. Well, now let's move towards uh, understanding better what those are. Now, common methods for measuring or testing for pH. Number one, there are pH meters. pH meters are electronic devices, and they are equipped with a pH-sensitive electrode, usually made out of glass or some other kind of compatible material. And you put the uh, electrode into your test liquid, and it measures the hydrogen ion activity in that solution. And it will then provide you a digital readout of the pH value. pH meters are known for their accuracy and their precision. So you've got that. You've also got on a simpler level, you've got pH indicator strips. Uh, back in chem, high school chem lab, you knew them as litmus paper. Now, indicator strips are paper strips that are impregnated with chemicals that change color when they're in the presence of a solution with a given pH. Uh, they are simple, they're quick, they're easy to use, and they're cost-effective. Downside is that they are less accurate when compared to pH meters. Um, and then if you're getting on a whole different level, you might choose to use uh, something like a universal indicator solution, which is a pH-sensitive dye that changes color over a wide pH range. When you add them to a solution, they change color, and the color change corresponds to the pH of that solution. Pretty simple. Now, these three common methods, they vary in their, or they have differing levels of accuracy, ease of use, and uh, you know which one's best for what kind of situation. But the broader point is that there are a range of options available to allow you to measure pH in your sample. Now, when people think of this concept of acidity, the majority of people think pH is always the go-to indicator of that. But we have to start considering that that's actually not really that true of a case. It's actually farther from the case than we might think. To understand why that is, we have to recognize or be familiar with what pH really is. So what pH is, pH is a scale that's actually supposed to express or measure the concentration of hydrogen ions in a water solution. Now, you may ask, what does that have to do with being an acid? Or what does that have to do with acidity, hydrogen ions? Well, if you think about it, when you think about acids, right, we think of acids as things that will attack or react with other things. You know, you put a piece of metal in an acid, the acid attacks the metal, it eats it up, it corrodes it, it damages it. Uh, if you, God forbid, were to spill some acid on your skin, some strong acid, it would start eating away at your skin, be pretty painful. And maybe if, you, if you're a film buff, you remember watching the movie Alien? 
when they cut into the alien on their spaceship, the alien's blood is supposed to be concentrated acid, and it drips on the floor, and it eats through multiple floors before it reaches the spaceship's hull. So this observation that acids attack materials comes from the chemistry concept that acids are defined as things that either donate protons or accept electron pairs when dissolved in water. Now, protons and electrons, when they're by themselves, when they're not paired up or attached to a stable molecule, they are extremely reactive particles. And they're looking around for other things to react with in order to make themselves whole or complete. So when we say that acids are things that donate or accept these protons and electrons, we're really saying that they are extremely reactive things. And this reactivity is why acids seem so eager to attack and corrode things. Now, another way to look at it would be, okay, go back to the skin example, right? You spill some acid on your skin and you get what they call a chemical burn. Chemical burns from acids are really the end manifestation of all those hydrogen ions from the acid um, reacting with these substances in your skin, lipids and the proteins, reacting with them, breaking apart uh, uh, you know, you know, those lipids, those fats, those proteins in your skin. And that skin damage that you see and feel is the end result of those acidic hydrogen ions reacting with the materials and molecules in your skin, trying to make themselves whole. So the thing that most people think of when... Uh, Thinking of this acidity concept, most commonly they think of this pH scale. pH estimates acidity because it actually is a measure of the number of those reactive hydrogen ions in a water solution. So the pH scale goes from 0 to 14. Uh, 7 is the neutral midpoint. 0 is the more acidic end. 14 is the more basic or alkaline end. And what's important to know about the pH scale, perhaps its biggest defining characteristic is that it's what's called a logarithmic scale. That means if you start at the lowest end of the scale, 14 here, and you start going down the scale towards the acidic end, towards zero, uh, what, what you see is that the Hydrogen ion concentration is actually, for every number that you progress, it goes up by a factor of 10, not goes up by 10, goes up by a multiple of 10. And so if you think about it, what this means is that um, each one number increase um, um, of acidity at, let's say, the far end of the scale at towards zero is, in practice, it's a much, much greater increase than an equivalent increase in the middle or at the other end of the scale because the scale is logarithmic. That's important to keep in mind if you're going to understand the significance or the meaning of someone who says, let's say they're comparing pairs of liquids. They're comparing the acidity of pairs of liquids, right? And they have uh, one liquid here has a pH of 6 and this other liquid has a pH of 4. Okay, so that's a pH difference of 2. And then they have another pair of liquids where one has a pH of 3 and another has a pH of 1. Again, same difference of 2 on the pH scale, but the practical difference in acidity is very, very different between those two pairs of liquids because of where they fall on the pH scale. Now, to maybe better illustrate this, to bring this home from a more practical standpoint, um, let's see how, take an example of how the acidity as reflected by the number of hydrogen ions present, how that acidity changes as we go down that scale from 14 towards zero. Now, remember that seven right in the middle is the neutral point. So let's start at seven and let's say that seven represents uh, one hydrogen ion in a liquid solution. As we go down the scale from 7 to 6 to 5 down towards 0, how many hydrogen ions do we have as each number changes? So if you've got one ion at uh, 7 
and you go down to 6, remember each number represents an increase of a factor of 10. That means we go from 7 to 6, we go from 1 to 10. Pretty simple. If you go from 6 to 5, you go from 10 to 100. If you go from 5 to 4, you go from 100 to 1,000. And now you can start seeing that logarithmic pattern developing, where the number of acidic hydrogen ions keeps increasing by a factor of 10, keeps getting greater and greater and greater. Now, remember, though, we're only down to 4. 4 is in the acid territory, but 4 is generally considered a weak acid. Yet, the difference in hydrogen ions and acidic activity, if you will, between a something with a pH of 4 and something with a pH of 7 is a thousand times greater. The 4 is a thousand times greater than the pH of 7. Now it starts getting really fun as we continue down. So the pH of 4 has, for our example, a thousand hydrogen ions. If you go to a pH of 3, it now has 10,000 hydrogen ions. And pH of 3 is about, uh, from a practical standpoint, pH of 3 is about where uh, orange juice is commonly found. Uh, so orange juice is 10,000 times more acidic than neutral water. Okay, go from 3 to 2, we go from 10,000 to 100,000. And somewhere between 3 and 2 is where you typically find both lemon juice and also, believe it or not, many common soft drinks like you know, regular Coke, which has phosphoric acid in it, has a pH typically somewhere in the twos. So 3 to 2 goes ten, uh, from 10,000 to 100,000. And then now we're in strong acid territory as we go from pH of 2 to pH of 1. You're going from a, uh, a 100,000 to 1 million. And you can go further down the scale as well. But what we're seeing is as we move further down the scale, we get closer to zero, even fractionally small, like 0.1 or 0.01 increases in pH in this strong acid range are going to be many times higher than bigger increases in the middle of the scale. That is the nature of this logarithmic pH scale. So let's go back and tie this to your diesel fuel. Typical fuel uh, pH, if it's normal healthy fuel, is going to be between 8 and five and a half, as we said earlier. If you could measure pH reliably, then something below a 5.5 would be considered abnormal. However, thing to keep in mind is that uh, just because your fuel might have a pH below 5.5 doesn't necessarily indicate that you have a problem. If your fuel with pH of, let's say, 5.1 Technically, it's considered abnormal, it's considered acidic, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to cause problems anytime soon. Each situation is a little bit different. At any rate, in order for any of this to mean something, we at least have to have a reliable way to measure this acidity of our fuel. And what we're finding is that pH may not be the best reflection of acidity in petroleum fuels because it's hard to have a reliable way to accurately measure pH in fuel. Now, what are some of the common options that uh, people consider for gauging pH? Remember, we talked about some of those earlier. The problem, though, is that those common ways of doing it have their own problems in themselves. So the litmus strips, litmus pH strips, again, that's what the, that's probably the first thing people think of when they think of uh, something to measure pH with. And litmus indicator strips are they work fine for certain kinds of things, um, you know, because they have a color change indicator uh, impregnated in them that was that changes color in response to number of hydrogen ions. You judge the pH from the color that the paper turns. But pH strips don't give an accurate reading in diesel fuel because they're not designed for reading fuel. They're designed to be used in water-based solutions. There are pH strips that are optimized for fuel, but uh, you know those work okay. Um, again, when you're talking about options, choosing options to measure pH, you do have to take certain things into consideration like cost and ease of use. But all of the things being equal, pH strips would not be the thing that you would want to choose 
if you were trying to measure uh, pH or acidity of fuel. What about a pH meter? Well, those are good in theory because, like we said earlier, they give you a more specific and more accurate reading. And in theory, um, they're better than color re relying on the interpretation of the color change of a litmus uh, strip. But like the strips, conventional pH meters aren't designed to be used in non-water-based solutions. Because remember, pH is supposed to be a notation of the acid concentration or more specifically the hydrogen ion concentration, but that's in water. Now, there are specialized meters that have specialized glass probes that are calibrated to be able to try and estimate pH in what, what, we, what we would call a non-aqueous, a non-water solution. Um, and if you were choosing, if you had to rely on something like that, that, that would be okay. But using a regular pH meter uh, for trying to do something like that wouldn't really be a good, good uh, a, a way to do it. I mean, these, these specialized meters, they, uh, one of the things is not only are there uh, probes made with special um, materials that are able to pick up and detect the, the way that those hydrogen ions ionize or behave, in non-water solutions, but they also are designed so that you calibrate them first with a test solution that is supposed to be like what you're going to be testing them in, basically so that they have a baseline in order to then measure the or detect the pH in your fuel. But even then, even if you do that, they're not always completely accurate in terms of giving you results that are one-to-one -one comparable with pH results taken from a water solution. And so, the long and short of it is pH is not that useful for quantifying acidity in non-water or non-aqueous solutions like fuel that don't give off hydrogen ions in the same way that water solutions do. That means pH may not be the best way to gauge your fuel's acidity. So, if we can't use pH, Seems like we're back to square one, right? We determined pH isn't good to use, but we know that acidity in fuel is something important that we need to figure out. So we have to look at different alternative ways to quantify that acidity if we can't use pH. Ways that don't rely on detecting the concentration of hydrogen ions in water. And there is one option that stands out as the actual best way to do this instead of pH, and that is an ASTM test, known as ASTM D664, standard test method for acid number of petroleum products. Now we would say that this is the best measure for acidity, but it's not the same as a pH test. We have to recognize this. pH and acid number aim to express similar conceptual things, acidity, but they do them in different ways and with different scales. In fact, unlike the pH scale, D664 is a test method specifically put together to gauge acidity of things like fuel. It was specifically created for use in fuel, whereas pH is specifically applicable for water solutions. So at its core, the D664 test looks at the amount of base, needed to neutralize the amount of acid that's present in your fuel sample. The more acidic your fuel is, the more base you're gonna to need to use to reach an input of neutralization in the test. And depending on how much that is, that helps calculate your fuel's acid number. That's the result on your test. Now, how do they run this test? Well, the test itself is not terribly complicated. Uh, and that's important because that means it's not going to be expensive for a lab to run. So how do you do it? Well, first thing you do, step one, sample preparation. You take a sample of your, your diesel fuel, your petroleum product. You dissolve it in a mixture of organic solvents, typically something like toluene and isopropanol. So you prepare your fuel sample. Then what you're going to do is you're going to gradually add small amounts of a standardized potassium hydroxide solution. That's the base, that's the alkaline. You're gonna add small amounts of this base to your sample in a process called titration. Titration is a standard laboratory process 
really just means that you're gradually adding one solution into another until whatever chemical reaction uh, that results, whatever chemical reaction results, uh, that finishes, basically. So potassium hydroxide is a base. And you're add, gradually adding small amounts of that base to fuel that's assumed to have some amount of acid in it. When you mix an acid in a base, right, there's a chemical reaction that happens as they neutralize each other. So the acids in the fuel are going to react to that potassium hydroxide base that you're gradually adding to the fuel, and they're going to neutralize each other. And so you're going to gradually add more and more base until all the acid in that fuel sample is deemed to be neutralized. And that is your end point, the point of neutralization, if you will. Now, once we know that we've hit that stopping point, we take the amount of uh, potassium hydroxide that we've added, we plug it into a formula, and you're able to calculate an acid number for your fuel. That is the end result that you're looking for. And if you think about it, this kind of test really is better than pH for telling us what we really want to know. How acidic is our fuel? Next question is though, now that we have a result, uh, what, you know, what results are considered bad? What, what's considered normal? I mean, if you look at pH, right? Someone says, well, this thing has a pH of 2.5. Most people, if you know anything about the pH scale, know that 2.5 is pretty acidic. Is there an equivalent way of interpreting acid number results? Uh, well, yes, there is. The general rule of thumb is that for the acid number test um, in fuel, a result of greater than 0 0.5, and that's milligrams of KOH, is what they call it. A result greater than 0 0.5 is considered bad enough that the amount of acid that's in that that fuel sample that generated those results is considered likely to result in storage problems in your tank over time. In other words, if you get a result greater than 0 0.5, it's a sign that you need to do something about it. And so that is the subject of monitoring and testing for acidity in our stored fuel. Lastly, some quick recommendations. One question commonly comes up is if, um, you know, how often do you need to run an acid number test? Uh, well, obviously, if monitoring fuel acidity is an important thing, you should do an acid number test on your fuel at least once a year. But you don't need to do it, you know, monthly or quarterly. We would recommend you do it at least once a year. Two times at the most are probably going to be enough for you to be well covered. Um, another really useful thing that you can use acid number for is a hint uh, as to whether you have a microbe problem. I mean, the test doesn't confirm microbes all by itself because it doesn't measure microbes. It measures acid. But if the test results tell you that the acid number is elevated, and you also know that microbes produce acid, right, then elevated test results could be a hint, a sign that you need to then follow up with a microbe test to make sure that the microbes aren't the cause of your fuel's acidic condition. And then if it turns out you do have a microbial contamination problem, there's things you know you can do to fix that. Get rid of the water, treat with biocide, break up that biomass using a dispersant and get it out of there. Uh, so the reason why the acid number test is really valuable here is it's an inexpensive way to head off future fuel and tank problems and to give you a really good clue that a bigger problem might be in the midst of developing so that you can then take the steps you need to get rid of that headache. And then last thing that we want to say to close this out, which is if you have acidic fuel, can you still use it? I mean, a lot of people ask that question. Maybe you have 2,000 gallons of diesel fuel that turns up with a high acid number. Do you have to, you know, throw all that out and eat thousands of dollars of cost? Simple answer is no. If you have an, a high acid number, the fuel's going to burn just fine. Acidity is much more about being an indicator of whether you might expect future problems to develop. But as far as using that fuel right now, yeah, you can use it just fine. But just be sure if you do have a high acid number, follow up with a microbe test to make sure that that's not what the cause is. And so that is it for today's episode of the Fuel Pulse Show podcast. Uh, if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe, uh, tell your friends about it, 
give us a good rating on wherever you get your podcast uh, episodes from because that really does help us out. So until next time, I am Eric Bjornstad, your host of the Fuel Pulse Show podcast, and we will talk to you next time. Bye-bye.